the, <coughs> the outline of this message uh, hopefully you've received on the way in who is this message for? this message is for the men and women and young people present who are Christians ladies and gentlemen the cross divides the world some of you have been to the cross you love the cross and when you stand under the cross of course you see everything clearly some of you have not yet been to the cross and therefore you don't know God at all and you don't know any of the privileges which come to us through Jesus Christ you can't think straight yet in spiritual areas because you're not yet spiritual men and women this message is for Christians basically for Christians who've not been Christians very long and it's a message about decision making so please have the outline open and in front of you and you'll see I believe that decision making is not so difficult as many of the books have told us now this is not about daily behavior a few weeks ago before I was off I spoke to you on the subject how to know what is right I showed you that in the Bible some things are right and some things are wrong but there's a whole lot of other areas where we have to make up our own mind this message is not about that and then a couple of weeks later I preached a message called how to please God and I explained that in our ordinary life we have five areas we live at home we go to work we live amongst our neighbors we have some time off and we spend money and I showed you what the Bible teaches about those five areas this message is not about that this message is about decision making here you are you've applied for a job it's been offered to you should I take it? you look sideways across the church you catch the eye of somebody should I marry him? you're thinking about the future you see the great need of the world especially after what Cliff has told us should I be a missionary? you're thinking of changing houses where should I live? those are great decisions most people have to make that sort of decision sometime but life is made of decisions isn't it? there are small decisions every day as well and as I was always told when I was young big doors swing on small hinges sometimes what we think is a small decision is one of the most important of all how do we make decisions? one of the elders of the church told me that if he could write a book he would write a book on how to make decisions well I hope that book will come out I hope it won't be too different from what I'm going to say but it's a grave problem how do I make decisions? how do I know the will of God? there are four steps as I understand the Bible and here they are first of all we must ask ourselves a question let me ask it to you now what do you really want to do? do you want to do God's will? or your own? what do you really want to do? there is that job there is that person there is that possible change of home there is that great decision what do you want to do really honestly everything hinges on that and even if we don't get past number one that would almost be enough because if God is so kind to us that if we really want to do his will if we really want to do what he wants almost always we manage to discover what it is look at 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 1 if you can't find it quick enough please listen Peter writing to Christians as I'm speaking to Christians he says this therefore since Christ suffered for us in the flesh arm yourselves also with the same mind for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men but for the will of God prepare to suffer says Peter anybody who's going to make any progress in finishing with sin has to suffer you've two choices 
says Peter. You can either live in this world following evil desires or you can do the will of God. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? What you want or what God wants? What your evil heart wants or what this holy God of scripture wants? What do you really want to do? Come to Romans chapter 12. When Paul has explained a great deal about the wonderful blessings which have been given to us in Jesus Christ, he then says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, Christian friends, you, we live our lives in the bodies. Give your body to God. Don't be like the people around you. Think differently. Give yourself to God. Don't hold anything back. And you will prove, discover, and prove the worth of the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is where nearly all problems of guidance are. If people don't find God's will, it's nearly always because deep down inside they are still nursing the desire to do their own will. What do you really want to do? What you want or what God wants? The whole issue is there. Now Jesus was speaking to some people once who didn't really know whether to believe what he said or not. And Jesus explained a very important principle. You'll find it in John 7:17. 7, this is what he said. If anyone wants to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. If you really want to do what God wants, you will know whether I'm speaking his words or just making them up. Now the principle is established. If you really want to do what God wants, then you will see things as God sees them. But if you don't want to do what God wants, then of course everything else will go wrong. So what do you really want? That is the question. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, says Solomon, and do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. There was a lady who came to a crossroads, well it was a fork in the road, I've told you this before, and she was seen throwing up her stick, and it came, landed down on the ground, and then she threw it up again, and it landed down on the ground, she threw it up again and this went on for some considerable time and someone said to her, why are you throwing that stick up in the air? Well, she said, I'm waiting for it to land to see which way it lands and then I'll know which way to go. But he said, you've already thrown it a dozen times at least and it always points that way. She says, yes, but I don't want to go that way. <laughs> and that is about it. If you've made up your mind which way you want to go, you'll never know which way God wants you to go. It is the moral question that has to be faced. Whose will do you really want? Do you want his will or your own? Which way do you really want to go? Are you open before God and do you say to him, I will go whatever way it is, but I want to go your way. That's number one. Number two, how you feel is of no importance when you make decisions. Now, it's something fact you found in my ministry when I say to people how you feel is of no importance, they say you're heartless. You're saying that my feelings don't matter, that nobody should be interested in them. That's not what I'm saying. When people weep, we should weep with them, and when they dance, we should dance with them. But in decision making, how you feel is of no importance. None whatever. If you can't write down in clear English sentences 
reasons why you have made your decision, then you are not acting like a Christian. If you just say, oh, I love him, and that's why you're going to marry him, and that's all you can say, I love him, then don't marry him. You should be able to define that love into clear reasons, what there is lovable about him, and what makes you love that. I just feel it's the right thing. What makes you feel it's the right thing? Write it down. Can you define in clear English sentences what it is that makes you feel it's the right thing? Feelings are of no importance. There is in the Old Testament a famous example of a man who made a ruinous decision on the basis of his feelings. Would you like to go there now with me to Genesis chapter 25? In the same home lived twin boys. The father had one of the boys as his favourite, the mother had the other boy as her favourite. Genesis 25, verse 27. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skilful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac, that's the father, loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah, that's the mother, loved Jacob. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom, which means red. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. In other words, give me all the rights of the older son. And Esau said, Look! I'm about to die. So what profit shall this birthright be to me? Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. And ever afterwards in the Bible when that incident is mentioned, we are told it was a bad decision. He was famished. He felt he was dying of hunger. Jacob was a twister and a schemer. Oh, give me some of that stew. Okay, do you promise in exchange for stew to give me the rights of the oldest son? Ah, what's, if I don't eat quickly, I'm going to die. And on the basis of an impulse, he lost everything. He felt it was the right thing. But he acted on impulse. He acted on impulse. Those sort of decisions are wrong. We have sinful desires. And they're never more evident than when we act on impulse. Coming to the book of Romans. Listen to these instructions given to Christians. Romans 6.12 Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts or strong desires. Sometimes you just have a strong desire to a thing and you make a decision on an impulse, on a feeling. It's ruinous. Look at Romans 14, 23. He who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith for whatever is not from faith is sin. Any decision I make which is not thought through with a view to pleasing God is a sinful decision. When it comes to our feelings, they don't count at all in decision making. That's one of the great differences between Christians and pagans. When Paul's writing to the Corinthians, who had been pagans, who had been worshipping idols, he eventually comes to the subject of spiritual gifts, which is not our subject this evening. But he starts his discussion by saying, when you were pagans, you acted like this and this and this. You can't act that way now that you're Christians. You've got to have a thoughtful approach when you come to the question of spiritual gifts. Now listen to what he said. Concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. In other words, something's got to pass through your mind. You know that you were Gentiles, 
carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Why did you worship idols? Why did you bow down to that statue? Why did you go into that temple? Well, you were just swept along. You were just carried along. You didn't think about it. You just did it. You turned off your mind and you just went that way. Then Paul says, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And he goes into his subject to explain that wherever the Holy Spirit is at work, nobody is swept along. You're not just carried along to do a thing because others were doing it or because you felt like it or because there was strong, some strong emotion pushing you that way. The Holy Spirit doesn't work that way. Other spirits do. That's why he says to Timothy, the spirit we've received is the spirit of a sound mind. That's why he said, as he did when we read Romans just now, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Everything that the Holy Spirit does, he does through the mind. That's why Peter says to every Christian, you should have a reason for the hope that's in you. Can you give reasons why you're a Christian? Can you give reasons why you believe? Can you give reasons why you made that decision? Those were the, that was the second point. Do you really want to do God's will? How you feel is of no importance. Now that's very important, isn't it? Because a lot of you are waiting to be led. I don't know what that means. But you're waiting to be led. You're in the prayer meeting and you don't pray because you're waiting to be led. I don't know what that means. You haven't spoken to somebody about Christ who perhaps you should have spoken to years ago because you haven't been led. You're waiting for some form of inward push your pulse rate to go up a little bit or I don't know what and you don't know what the Holy Spirit doesn't work that way he works through the mind which is why of course the central part of our worship is sermons not singing <laughs> number three this is how you find the will of God three stages the Bible open Think and pray. The Bible open. It's very hard to see in the dark. So turn on the light. The light is God's word. This is what it says in Psalm 119. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. If you haven't hidden God's word in your heart, you're going to sin against him. This is what it says in the same psalm. Here we are. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If you haven't got the Bible open, you've turned the light out. This is what it says in the same psalm, the entrance of your words gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. However simple you are, you can understand if the Bible is shining in. No decision can be made without the Bible open, without feeding on the Bible, without absorbing the Bible, without listening to the Bible preached, without reading it for yourself, without thinking about it and meditating on it, without making it part and parcel of your daily life. You've turned the light out if you've closed the Bible. The Bible open, think. Oh, they're foolish, says Moses when he's writing his last song. Because they never ask what they're getting themselves into. That's Deuteronomy 32, 29, Oliot translation. They never think about their latter end, it says in the Bible. But in fact, what he's meaning is they never think about what they're getting themselves into. Think, where will this road lead? Think, 
What do wise friends say? The Bible says the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. One of the great marks of a fool in the book of Proverbs is that he doesn't take advice. He's convinced that the way he sees things is the right way. The book of Proverbs always also says there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is death. It seemed like the right road, it seemed such a good thing to do, but it led to hell. You must think, you must take advice, and you must ask, what are circumstances saying? Because we believe that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. There is significance in every event in my life, everything which happens to me. What are those circumstances saying? So with the Bible open, I think, I think, and I think, believing that the Holy Spirit works through my thoughts. Thoughts, of course, which are directed by the scriptures. Let's turn the page over. The Bible open, think, and pray. Jesus said, pray every day. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you? Paul said, I pray for you, Colossians, that you may have enlightened minds, that you may know the will of God and be wise. Do you pray like that for other Christians and for yourself? James said, if you lack wisdom, and we do, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. God will give it to him without saying, I told you so. But you must believe if you ask for wisdom, says James, that you're going to get it. Otherwise you'll be an unstable, double-minded person. Prayer is absolutely essential in guidance. There is what an old writer calls the principle of stratification. Now on holiday you've seen the rocks and the cliffs. And you've seen that they're layers of rock. Quite distinct. Sometimes they're different colours. Sometimes there's a different hardness about them. Those are called strata. There is a principle called stratification where things go into their strata. Now, in prayer, with the Bible open, as you think, the thoughts which most honour God come to the top of the mind. And the thoughts which most gratify and please our sinful hearts go downwards. There's a principle of stratification. So as we think and pray and ask that the Lord will give us wisdom, as we have his word open and we think about the consequences and we ask him to have mercy upon us, it becomes clearer and clearer because all the thoughts that honour him float to the top and the thoughts which dishonour him become less and less obvious. And so we see clearly. Jesus didn't even choose the twelve disciples until he had prayed all night because of this great principle of stratification. So, if you really want to do God's will, you really do. If you ignore your feelings and impulses, if you open the Bible and think and pray, not suddenly, but certainly, you will come to a settled conviction about what you should do. Sometimes it will come in the most surprising ways. We must make a distinction between the guidance we look for and the guidance we receive. But somehow we will come to a settled conviction. God doesn't play with us. If we want to know his will, he will reveal it to us. His spirit will work in our thought processes. He will not ignore the scriptures. But we will come to a settled conviction and our hearts will be at peace about the decision that we have to make. Which brings me to point four, which is brief. When you know what to do, do it. 
Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. When you've come to that settled conviction about what you should do, then do it. Jesus said when he came into the world, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. If you're convinced you're doing the will of God, then delight and do it. And you will find out how good God's will is. You will prove, says Paul, what is the good. Ah, it's so good. Acceptable, because it's the way that pleases God. And perfect, because it's the way that leads to spiritual maturity. Good, acceptable and perfect will of God. Now somebody says, does that mean I won't make any mistakes? Listen, we are sinful men and women. We will make lots of mistakes. We're imperfect. We're still going to get it wrong. But those mistakes, sincerely made, made in prayer, but nonetheless because of your imperfection, made, those mistakes will not ruin you. Isn't that wonderful to know that? Some Christian teachers say that if you make one wrong decision, then you're condemned to be a second rate or third division Christian for the rest of your life. Not true. You may make lots of wrong decisions in your life, but if you follow these principles, they will not ruin you. The Bible says this, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So all you have to do is be a good man or woman. And he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. Have you ever taken a toddler by the hand? Toddler learning to walk? You used to walk like that. Then he falls over. But it doesn't break his back or his femur. And you've got him by the hand anyway. He's soon on his feet again. And going along the path with an unsteady pace, but it's getting steadier all the time. That's the way he learns to walk. It didn't ruin him, that falling over. That's exactly the picture which that Psalm 37 gives us. God has his hand in ours. We will fall, but we'll never fall over forever. We will fall, but we will always get up. God himself stops us from falling irretrievably. All things, even our bad decisions, are working together for good. We're going to heaven, but even on earth, we may know God's will.